Good morning. Thank you for attending the meeting. And uh, I'd like to thank Index Fresh and uh, California Avocado Commission for the kind invitation and the opportunity to be with you. We learned a lot while being here, and I hope that I will manage to tell you something new. And what I would like to do is to actually convince you that the, long, the short term solution to the problem will be a proper management of the grove or the orchards. Uh, but before I will go uh, tell, telling you on the beetle and the problem, I would like to share with you a few, few, few slides on the water issue in Israel since the Californian Israeli agriculture business are, share a lot of similarities. So first of all, here we are in Israel actually is a crossroad between three uh, continents. And uh, we actually share problems and pests and diseases coming from all, all directions. Uh, Israel is quite dense popula uh, country. Most of the population is located along the coastal plain. As you can see, the Tel Aviv area is highly dense population. Actually, in this part of the Israel, Israel the dense population density in Israel is quite similar to that of India. Uh, the area is a desert. As you see the map of the Middle East, you see the southern area, which include North Africa and Saudi Arabia, and part of Israel is desert with less than 100 millimeter of rain a year. However, the north part of the area receive much more rain. However, uh, if you look again, the rainfall map of Israel, the most, the water are mainly needed in the southern part of the country where the agriculture is concentrated. So, um, as you see from these figures, 80% of the water are in the north. However, 65% uh, of the water are used in the south part of the country. We enjoy three water resources. One of them is the Sea of Galilee. The other one is the coastal aquifer, and then the mountain aquifer. Actually, one of our conflict with the Palestinian population is actually the water issue, which is the mountain aquifer that we share together with the Palestinians. To solve the problem of water in the southern part of the country in the early 50s, Israel, construct, Israel constructed a, big, a, a project with a pipeline which taking the water from the Sea of Galilee and distribute it in the south. Actually, this, this action actually changed the entire agriculture in Israel when this part of the country was almost a desert, similar to what is happening in California, of course. Uh, this is a major agriculture area now. However, this is uh, not enough. And the water, the rainwater, and the water coming from the Sea of Galilee is not enough to sustain uh, Israeli uh, agriculture. So this is the Sea of Galilee, and one of the problem in this case are saline spring located in the north part of the lake. So in order to solve this problem, uh, we have a, a tunnel, open tunnel, that take the saline water and so we can pass by the lake and put them back into the Jordan River. Another source of water are treated sewage influence. So most of the agriculture in Israel today is supported by recycled water and not by fresh water, including the avocado industry. Another source of water is rain enhancement. So we see the clouds with silver iodide, and that's actually allow us to increase uh, the rain by 15%, which is a lot. 
However, that's not enough. And during the last years, Israel built some facilities to desolation of seawater. This is one of the plant here in Ashkelon, the southern part of the country. Uh, this is how it looks like in, from inside. You see the streets, so the main filtration pools, and then the pumping system related to that, with that. And of course, the osmosis process area, which where we, the, the salt is being removed from the water. Actually, by these two plants, Israel managed, Israel managed to supply all need of fresh water, drinking water, I mean, without relying on any other source. So in time, uh, the efficiency of using water is increasing, as you see from this graph. And uh, for example, Israeli uh, was the pioneer in using the drip irrigation system, which really saved a lot of water. And I noticed that even here, people still use sprinklers, and not, irrig and not drip irrigation. Another thing is precision agriculture, so we can measure exactly the needs of the plant in terms of water supply. And by doing this, we also manage to save some water. So this is the entire picture of how we manage to, to live and to have rather decent agriculture with low amount of water. Okay, now let's move to the uh, ambrosia beetle. We share that problem as well. Uh, I must say that uh, when we started to work on the problem in Israel, we needed to do a very careful calculation because we knew that we cannot address every single issue that related to the problem. And uh, the problem is tough. And it's tough because there is no much information available about this group of pests. And the only good example of ambrosia beetle being a pest of fruit orchards is coming from uh, uh, Florida, from the East Coast. And even then, they didn't have any, not much information about the effect of the ambrosia beetle, the Laurel Bay ambrosia beetle, on the avocado plantations. But the alarm information coming from that beetle killing other Persea trees like Swamp Bay and Laurel Bay was very alarming. So at first we were alarmed by the typical symptom of the, of the damage. Uh, actually, we have quite a few insects that attack avocado trees in Israel, but none of them is really serious. And the ambrosia beetle is actually the main issue now. So this is the beetle. The female is a little bigger than the male. When you remove the four wings, you see the flying wings. So the male are not occupied with uh, developed wings, so they cannot fly. And you see the female with very good wings, so female can fly. We are not like, sure exactly what is the flight distance, but uh, we've already been told about it. Th these are more or less the figures. You made a cross section at the head of the beetle, you can see these two pockets. This one is more clear. In this pocket, the beetle keeps the fungi that they carry with it. And this is actually the beetle tool. I would say that this a photo of a branch dying after colonization of the beetle, it's the old story. Look at, pay attention please to this part of the branch. You see the symptom of colonization, the rest of the branch is dry. And this is the old story and I would like using this story to convince you that management is the major issue. Again, these are typical system of dying branches. These dying branches are all related to the activity of the, the ambrosia beetle. This is uh, the picture taken in Escondido, which show more or less uh, the same symptom, although it's not exactly uh, the same beetle. This is a cross section in a thin branch, and you can see the entrance, and you can see the gallery and the beetle. 
This is avocado, this is box elder. The picture is more or less the same. And later on, you see the development of the beetle inside the galleries, and you can see the fungus develop on the wall of the galleries. You see here mature beetle, the mature beetle here, you see the pupa and you see the larvae. The female lay usually two or three eggs each time, then the eggs hatch and the larvae begin to feed on the fungus that develop on the wall of the gallery. The development cycle is rather short, something between seven, uh, five to seven weeks. However, the entire process is much longer than that, and we don't always know for how much long the population will stay in the same infested spots. Usually in avocado, in Israel, when they usually kill thin branches, they stay there for one or two generations. When it comes to other trees, like box elder or oak trees, they may stay in the infested sites for something like 10, 15 generations before they decided to emerge from this point. Here you see cuts in uh, branches. This is an early stage of infestation. You see the pupa and the lava, and this is the last one. You can hardly see any immature stages, and the beetle here are ready to emerge. However, the beetle may stay there quite long time, as long as they can find some feed. As long as the fungus, mainly the fusarium, manage to stay in the branch, the beetle can stay there as well. However, as soon as the condition of the branch deteriorates and the branch becomes dry, the beetle tends to, to leave it. Here you see this typical uh, symptom of emergence. This is not a penetration hose, but emergence hose. And again, you see a cut in a branch and you see the galleries, this part of the branch, this car is almost dry, but it still managed to sustain some beetles. You see the beetle here, they find some food here, but they will soon emerge. You know that this branch is quite dry because termites already colonized the, the, this part uh, of the branch. When you measure the age distribution of the population in a branch. Uh, here we give you an information about tree season in March, July, and October. And we divided the age structure into five stages. So during spring, you will find mainly the mature larvae, the pupa, and the adults. During other season, we find all development stages. It's actually, in the uh, climatic condition of California, I, I'm, expecting, I'm expected, you will find all development stages almost any time uh, in a grove. Uh, these are typical, these are typic this is typical symptom of penetration of the beetle into a branch. The beetle, or the problem was discovered or was seen in Israel almost in 2008. But at first, the growers and the extension officers didn't recognize it as a problem because these lesions are very similar to other symptoms of you know, uh, physical damage caused to the branch. So however, when you look closely, you see these are not exactly, this is not exactly the same thing, but again, with an untrained eye, you will don't see uh, the difference. This what we saw, did what we, what we saw in about four years ago in the first heavily infested uh, orchards. So these signs were very alarming. That's why we, first of all, thought about chemical control of the beetle, although we were not very sure whether we would be successful or not. And the reason is that previous experiment, we don't have good experience with 
controlling ambrosia beetle of this group in general. And we know that uh, biological control is not a good option because the beetles, these beetles are not attracted to sex or aggregation pheromone. We knew that uh, there are no many natural enemies of ambrosia beetles and reaching the beetles inside the thick branches will be almost hopeless. So that's why we thought about chemical control. However, during the first years, we missed the point because these big lesions, you can take here a close look on these lesions, actually indicates that the tree more or less managed to overcome the penetration of the beetle. So under these big lesions, you find nothing except from the fungus that stays behind. So the beetle tries to penetrate the tree. As soon as the beetle begins to bore into the xylem, it releases the fungus. But in most cases, it's an unsuccessful attack. For example, this is a branch which was penetrated by the beetle. We looked for the beetle, so we removed the bark, and we removed part of the xylem here. This is a process. And here you see the staining uh, xylem. We dig some more, and then we see the beetle here. But this beetle will not reproduce in this branch. The branch is in a good shape. There is no chance that the beetle will manage to uh, produce offspring at this stage. So what, uh, uh, that's what we did is to uh, colonize the branches ourselves in order to follow the development of the beetle. And you can see here those tubes with beetles that were there in the lab, and we put them in those plastic tubes to let them penetrate the branches of different branches. And you see after a couple of weeks, we return back to the orchard, we can see the response of the tree to the attempt of the beetle to colonize the branch. However, the, reproduction, the reproductive success of the beetle was very low. Here in this graph, you see, we, we talk about very many attempts to colonize branches. So the penetration was okay, the gallery initiation was okay, but when it comes to larva production, only about two to three percent of the cases we could see development of immatures. So eventually all what we did was for vain because nothing was achieved. So uh, we, I'm jumping here to a plot of uh, oak trees. Since the beetle is also a big problem in oak trees in Israel, in this plot we measure the susceptibility of different hog species to beetle attack. So in order to make sure that uh, our colonization will be successful this time, what we do is first of all, we drill the tree and then we inoculate the small holes with the fungi and only later on we colonize the branch with the beetle. We repeat the same process here in avocado groves. So here you can see the results or the outcome of the injection of the fungus alone to the tree. And you can see the response of the tree to injection of the fungus after two weeks and after six weeks. And after six weeks, you take a look at one of the lesions and it looks like exactly as in the penetration spot of the beetle. But again, you see the symptom, no beetle inside. In order to understand the process, I would like to take you to another experiment we conducted in already two years ago. So in July 2013, we colonized the branches with uh, the beetles, with no injection of fungi, because then 
We didn't understand the process properly. So we came after about two weeks, we could see the symptom. However, until uh, August, we couldn't see anything, no real development inside the branch. And successful colonization and development of the beetles in the branch occurs only a year later. So this is a natural infestation. So only when the branch was ready or weak enough to support the development of the beetle, we could see that something is going on inside the branch. You see, here you see branches that were colonized by the beetle. And I would like to, to take you to this section of the branch. And this is a close look at the same branch. And the first uh, successful colonization started fall of 2014. And the, it take, the emergence of the branch is expected only in the fall of 2015. Because only in April 2015, we could see the, the, the development of immatures. So it took almost half a year between the first attack and the establishment of brood in the branch. So what we found out that the beetles, at least the, our beetles, has the tendency to attack branches which were already attacked previously. So when you compare branches which are not infested or branches in orange that already infested, you find that more than 85% of the beetle in the grove prefer to colonize the damaged branches and not the healthy branches. Here you can see that the major attack occurred in the, in the, late, in the late summer. So few in the spring, some in mid-summer, and uh, most of them in very late summer. So here you can see Again, a branch. This branch is uh, dying because of the colonization of the beetles. So we, we cut it here, and we cut it in another two, two points. So first of all, we make a cut here, and you see the result. You see the drying wood, and you see the galleries of the beetle. You see the staining wood, but you see here is a here the tissue is still healthy. And when you remove the cut here, you see that this part of the branch is healthy. What you see here is only the staining of the wood. We have some idea what is, what is the source or what is the cause of the staining, but it's too early to say uh, very accurate uh, facts about that. Let's look at this as a model. So at first, when the avocado tree is infested by the beetles, you see those big sugar cane volcano, mainly on the main, on the trunk and the main uh, branches. But this point are with no beetles. So the trees is vital enough and the beetles are unable to develop under these points. Later on, you find more and more beetle colonizing the branch, the tree, and you can see more of the infestation point on the thin branches. Now take a look, let's uh, examine this part of the, of the model and, and this part. And now you have a live branch. This is the dead branch. This part is the part that was, was colonized by the beetle. So the beetle colonized this part of the bark of the uh, branch because this part of the branch can get support of water from the live main branch. This part of the branch is already dead and dried and you don't find beetle inside. So if we take sections from the branch, you will find, you don't find anything here. You see the galleries here 
And very close to the junction here, you don't, see, you don't find anything because the tissue here is too healthy for the beetle, so the beetle cannot reproduce very close to the live, healthy branch. However, later on, if the attack continues, the beetle colonizes more and more part of the tree, and even more thick branches may be uh, successfully colonized by the beetle, like in this case. You see, we hope and Stanley already showed you this uh, photo. You see, again, this is a thicker branch, but is already uh, successfully infested by the beetle. When you, when you examine the lower parts of the tree, in case of avocado, you see nothing. This tree, this tree, when it was cut, it was already almost dead. However, you see nothing. This tissue is still healthy and live. When you, it comes to other trees like box elder or English oak, the beetle successfully attacked the thick part of the tree, including the base of the tree. We used, a, because box elder is so productive in terms of beetle supply, we use box elder many times in order to make sure that we have enough supply of beetles in our lab. Avocado is not a good supplier of beetles. Again, we can look at this picture from another angle. If we measure the lesion density on different parts of the tree according to the diameter of the stem of the, or the branch. And what we can see here that in avocado, the main lesion are concentrated on thin branches, while in the case of the other tree, like the box elder, English oak, and sycamore, you see that most of the lesions are concentrated on the thick branches and main stem. So it's very different, different what is happening in avocado. Same thing when you measure the uh, gallery development, is actually the same picture. Gallery development is good on the relatively thin branches in avocado, and gallery development in other trees are very successful on very thick branches and in, in, inside a stem. So in case of the other trees, these are the point of penetration and the point of uh, success, uh, reproductive success of the beetle. So when it comes to a factor that relate to attack density and a successful development of the beetle in avocado orchard, I would say that we are focusing on there are many factors, but these, I, I believe, are the main issue, is the tree speed, the difference between tree species and avocado varieties, seasonality, and the, in, the infestation along the warm season, sanitation, it's a major issue, and alternating bearing, which is also have some effect on the overall attack density and successful of the beetles in avocado trees. When it comes to a susceptibility between different species, there here is a list of uh, tree species that we uh, gather some information about them. As we know for sure that box elder is the most susceptible. Avocado is in among one, uh, those which are less susceptible. So avocado is much less susceptible than other trees. When it comes to avocado varieties, we see also some uh, differences. Some of the varieties are considered uh, very susceptible, like Fino and Us, and others are considered much less susceptible to the attack by uh, the beetle. Uh, we don't have, uh, we, don't, we don't use lure yet to attract the beetles, and this is unfortunate because the traps and the lures are 
a very good tool to monitor the activity, the seasonal activity of the beetle. What we did is to monitor the accumulation of lesion on branches, and we found out that there is a tendency uh, of increasing attacks on the tree during the warm season. So at the end of the warm season, the attacks are much more intensive, and we can understand that when we consider that one of the major factor that in Kajo triggered the beetle to leave the branch is the drying, is the drought, or the branch, or the siccation of the branch. So we can assume that in late summer, uh, many of the branches have, which were already affected by the beetle become dry, and that's triggered the beetle to leave them, and that's why we see more attacks on the trees in the end of the summer. Again, when poor sanitation is a big problem, those growers that keep their orchard clean usually don't suffer very much from the beetle. In this case, there was a, a, some plantation that uh, the sanitation was not done as it should, and you see a lot of attacks by the beetles on the thin branches. Alternating here is also, it's not a problem, it's a fact that the beetle, the trees suffer more after on ear and less after off ear. And that's again, we, if we consider that the, the beetle need weakness, weak, weakened branches, so we can assume that after on here, the trees are not in a very good shape. Here I would like to share with you some information we analyzed just before we left Israel, which uh, display uh, the yield in six, the last six years in different areas, different uh, kibbutzim in this case, and most of the information is coming from Haas. You have here the name of the area, you have here the year, I, I'm not sure you can, everybody can see the planting here, but this is not the issue. Uh, and you can see when, from where we, we could have the information. And the green bars uh, indicate that the beetle is not, or the problem is not there yet. Uh, the yellow bars means moderate infestation, and the red bar uh, are a mean uh, severe infestation. And you, uh, if you look at the information display here in general, you don't see much effect of the beetle on yield. And this is the impression of most of the grower in Israel. If you take care of the plantation, you don't see much effect on the, 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 the plantation production. This is another uh, group of uh, plantations with the same kind of information. Here we have the tons per hectare, I forgot to mention that. And in this case, for example, a lawn is an area when the beetle didn't arrive yet. That's the, why all the bars are, are green. Here in, you, can, you can even see where, when the beetle arrived in any area according to the, uh, cure, according to the color of the bar. So uh, the overall, uh, or the bottom line, I would say, of the first analysis of, of the information is that if the orchard is properly managed, you don't see any significant losses because of the activity of the beetle. Uh, even four years ago, we pay much attention, as I mentioned earlier, to chemical control, and, but of course we consider uh, other measure like uh, biological control, chemical ecology means using chiromone and pheromones. We thought about preventive measures. We thought about resistance or tolerance. However, I don't want to take too much of your time, but uh, we got to the conclusion that uh, some of the ideas that are raised, are, um, is, are raised here, like using endophyte, for example, are very interesting and shouldn't be pursued, 
but in the short run, the, your best option is to make sure that the grove will be free clean from infested um, material as, uh, as much as possible. This is, in my view, the best, the best solution. Here, for example, you can see in photos that taken from experiments we, we conducted in order to measure the effect of Buveria bassiana, which is an entomopathogenic fungi that uh, was suggested as a tool to cope with the beetles. We know that uh, bark beetle and ambrosia beetles are extremely susceptible to Bavaria bassiana, and there was a lot of logic to test this fungus against the beetle. The fungus is an is a environmentally friendly tool. However, uh, from a practical point of view, we don't see any progress, good progress in application on the fungus. And uh, the idea is that you will be able to use the fungus as a preventive measure. And if you need to spray your growth with the fungus, often, of course, nobody going to do that. Uh, we found some mites that uh, uh, infest the beetles. We still study the role of several, some of the species. We have an idea uh, to use the mite as a vector of Boveria bassiana, so the mite can penetrate the galleries, carry with them the Boveria bassiani, bassiana, and that's the way we may, we may kill the beetle. I, what to say, I'm not very enthusiastic about that because I think that it's very interesting from scientific point of view. In reality, it's not going to work. And here you have a list of uh, insecticides we tried to use against the beetle. We test them in the lab. We test them. Some of them were tested in the grove with no much luck so far. Here, for example, you see there are about seven or six insecticides, and you see the mortality, the accumulate mortality. Some of them were good, and in the lab managed to cause 100% mortality of the beetle. Some others uh, were not so good. However, when it comes to their effect on the beetle population in the grove, uh, the story is a bit different. Here, another example of testing different uh, insecticide from different groups by actually spray cover of branches. That may work, uh, but again, uh, some of the more promising uh, compounds didn't work very well, so they're not significantly different from the control. Some other uh, compounds that were mentioned earlier by a team, like Bifentrin, we call it, in Israel it's called Talstar. It's a very good compound and it may protect the, the, the branch from being penetrated by the beetle, but again, it is a pretrade we'll, with all what comes with it. And, and the idea now, uh, what we are testing now, is how to use the uh, Bifentrin to protect certain spot uh, which are which already infested or colonized by the beetle in order to prevent other beetle uh, to join them. Another issue is what you do with the thinning slash. And we use, the grower use this machine in, to smash the branches for two small pieces. And then these small pieces are being treated by insecticides. And we found out you use different things, different trin or even oil, mineral oil. They're all good enough to uh, prevent the emergence of the beetle. What you need to do is to make sure that the treated material will be covered for about a month, and after a month, you are quite safe in what concerned the emergence of the beetles. If we tested a long ago injection of systemic insecticides, 
and uh, we don't have uh, very good results, but I'm not sure that uh, uh, we have good information to say that it will not work. But this was done about uh, four, three years ago, and our understanding how the beetle behave then was not very accurate. So maybe there is hope for systemic insecticides, but on the other hand, I wonder if uh, people make the efforts to take the, what is needed in order to do the injection. Uh, we here for, in case of uh, uh, other trees, uh, we had some success protecting trees by uh, neonicotinoids. Uh, in case of box elder, we manage, we do it in several gardens. Uh, the treatment was successful. It was true in some in oak trees. We, if the oak were in the first phase of colonization, the treatment were very good. However, in all trees, including sycamore, if the tree was already heavily infested by the beetles, the treatment were, were for nothing. So now they, they didn't help, really help. But in this case, when you see the first symptom of the beetle in the sycam this sycamore tree, when you treat him properly, you manage to actually avoid the, the damage caused by, by the beetle. Another idea is to use infusion uh, instead of injection. Uh, we did not test this approach in avocado grove. We use it in eucalyptus trees to avoid another problem. But it seems to, we seem, it seems to me that infusion of emamectin benzoate, which is a good product because it's an effective insecticide against the beetle, and it also has fungal activity, that may be, that may help. So uh, what, if you ask me what are the recommendations to the Israeli grower, usually what we tell them is uh, that what they need to do is extensive monitoring of the infestation to remove thin uh, diameter branches which were already attacked. You see the typical signs on the base of the branch. Uh, and. Uh, of course, you need to remove wilting branches and the main branches which are attacked by the beetle. You see the signs, even you are not very sure, and usually you don't find any beetles behind those lesions. We suggest to uh, spray this section of the branch with uh, bifentrin in order to uh, kill beetle that will join this infested spot uh, uh, later on. And thank you for the attention. A lot of the pictures showed, you know, the multiple lesions. And I, I know of a tree up in Santa Barbara County that has that, but there's other things that cause that that symptom to appear, right? Bacterial lesions, yes. and bacterial cankers. So I think we've been told to scrape one away to look for the entry point. Um, but how common is in Israel to see both, you know, like, is it hard to detect one from the other? Well, it's, uh, in, the re in the last years, it's quite common because we, the plantations also suffer from both Botryosphaeria as well as from the Ambrosia beetle. But usually you don't see that on thick branches. What we saw here, we saw, some, we saw lesions that were caused by fungi and not by the beetle. And I think that in your, your situation is more, a little bit more complicated because the association between the beetles and the fungi may accelerate the establishment of the beetles in different parts of the tree. Doctor, I'm going to ask the same question again. I don't know if you were present uh, that I asked earlier, uh, so I'll restate the question. I find, uh, let's say I find in my grove a, a tree uh, that has uh, 
uh, four or five entry spots that I think is that uh, on the trunk and two or three entry spots out on the uh, uh, one of the limbs, let's say a four inch limb, something like that. What do I do about it? I'm, I'm sure this is all just being developed and so forth, but do I have the potential? Do I, uh, at the very end there, and I didn't quite take it all in of your presentation, you talked about cutting a certain limbs back and so forth. Let's say I have a fully infected uh, tree with five or six spots around the, the base of it and some up in larger limbs. What do I do about it and how, would, how do I go about going back into and eliminating that, uh, uh, those areas that are infected uh, to save the tree or do I have to end up taking the whole tree down? Well, uh, my experience with the grower in Israel, they are reluctant to cut uh, big, big branches, of course. Uh, so that's, and, and they don't need to actually, because only the thin branches are usually are successfully colonized. So when you see a thin branch, if it's thin enough, I suggest to remove it. If you see that if the branch wilts, I suggest to remove it as fast as possible. When you have a big branch, one penetration will not be the end of it. And when you see the, the persitol coming out, this is a good indication that the branch actually responds to, to the penetration. So that's why we actually recommend to spray the, this section with insecticide in order to avoid the accumulation of beetles in that particular site. So that's how you protect the branch, actually. Because we know that the fungus doesn't move and develop very slowly without the presence uh, of the beetle. So there is solution. The, the question is, how, how much is the effort to reach those spots in your tall trees? But that's what we, rec we recommend now, and this is being tested now, for also from the economical aspect, whether it is worth to pay somebody to walk into through the, through the orchards and to spray those spots. In, in response to that, then, basically we've got a four inch branch, let's say, and it has an entry point, and there's three or four entry points in a localized area. And I decide I want to eliminate that. I would start cutting uh, somewhere near the entry point and looking for a gout and continue back towards the main part of the tree until. There's no more gallery? No, usually you find the gallery in the galleries near the junction. Usually. So, junction of yeah, yes. So if you remove, you see the situation at the junction. And we also consider to treat this part of the tree with fungicides, but we don't have good information about that. But usually we reach a clean tissue spray the area, spray the spots, and that's all. I have a question over here. Um, have you been able to compile any data um, to suggest in affected groves um, what trees are dying versus what trees you're able to keep alive? What do you mean by so, what tree? So in, in, in an affected grove in Israel, for example, uh, depending on the severity of, of the infestation, um, what portion of that grove or tree has died all the way um, versus usually, usually it's never happened. Okay. Uh, we got some, uh, I would say, wrong impression during the, uh, I would say, four or five years ago when we start to study the problem. And uh, uh, I don't know, with luck or without luck, uh, I'm, we, we, work, we study some trees in plantation that were not in a very good uh, health situation. 
And we not always suffer, could separate between the, the beetle issue and other factors. So in the old plantation, we could see, we could see dying trees. But after the, the, the grower decided to uproot the trees and to replace avocado with persimmon, we had the opportunity to cut uh, quite few trees and to examine them. And we found out that uh, the, their trees were not killed by the ambrosia beetle. There was a question um, at the last CAC sponsored meeting in Ventura or a statement made that uh, growers in San Diego were being asked not to prune anymore because of the uh, what seemed to be more beetles in the prune trees. And so my question is, are the beetles attracted because of the stress of the pruning? Are they attracted to the perceatol that's being emanated? And uh, what do you think about that? Well, if... Uh, well, in case of the... LA beetle or the Israel beetle, I would say that the pruning does not have a significant effect on the attraction of the beetles. I don't know. People here in San Diego area think, think differently. They, they suggest, I keep suggest that pruning actually attract the beetles. It might be so, of course, but, uh, and it's known in case of many other uh, wood boring beetles that they are attracted <coughs> to, to the fresh uh, pruning scars. But I would say there is a solution to that. So if the beetles are attracted to the, the pruning part, all you need to do is to protect it with insecticide. So that's not, should prevent you from, from pruning your, your orchard. When you were showing the different areas and the yields, there was one graph on the second slide that showed a red bar of heavy infestation that went to two yellow bars of moderate infestation. So how did that grove achieve that? Are they spraying every five weeks or what? You know, the, the, the growers in Israel were confused, as naturally enough, because uh, first of all, many of them were reluctant to use insecticides because uh, there, are, uh, there are so many insects that are waiting for this insecticide. There are long list of insects that are under very good biological control, mainly scale insects. And uh, if you start to spray with uh, peritroids, you will destroy the biological balance. So they were reluctant to do so. Uh, other people uh, decided to spray on the spot because they were alarmed. But eventually, if they took good measure, they removed the, the infested branches, and some of them spray the orchard. I don't believe that they achieved much by spraying the orchard with insecticides. Of course, you spray the, the, the grove with a peritroid or with a carbamates, of course, you kill almost anything, and you kill the beetles as well, but that's not enough to reduce the population of the beetles. So I, we, we suggest that you know, a good feeder sanitation actually is the best thing you can do. You've mentioned field sanitation. Uh, one of the elements of field sanitation is to remove infected branches. What else um, are you referring to? Besides feeder sanitation. No, besides removing an infected branch. Uh, field sanitation to you means yeah, what? No, just, of course, if I mean feed sanitation, and you have to get rid, you have to treat the thinning slash properly in order to avoid the beetle to emerge uh, from the thinning slash. Well, it, it, at first, when most of the plantation were still uninfested, we, pay much, we paid much attention to other hosts like uh, castor bean, a box elder, because box elder could supply beet, one tree can supply a beetle of one hectare of avocado trees. So uh, it was important to take, pay attention to these trees, but not anymore. When you have the beetles everywhere in Israel, or almost everywhere, 
what you need to do is to make sure that you are uh, clean the, the orchard as much as possible. Of course, if there are uh, you know, sites which are covered by castabin, which is heavily infested, you should do something about that. Usually what we uh, suggest a grower is not to cut the castabin, but to use it as a trap plant. So to cover the castabin with insecticide, so the beetle will be attracted to the castabin and will die while penetrating the castabin. You don't need to attract the beetle. The beetle is already, be, is already attracted to the castabin, especially if the castabin is already infested. So if you, we, we, yes, we found out that if you use 2% solution of bifentrin, it lasts more than a year. So one treatment should be enough. And that's also true for covering certain spots on, on the avocado tree. Of course, people are reluctant to use bifentrin because the avocado industry in Israel is rely on export and mainly to European market, and they have to be very sensitive about that. So that's why they are looking for some substitute. They don't, don't, they don't uh, the different train, the tall star is, is uh, the, the, I would say, the default, is the last alternative. But they should do that until we will find something better to cover those uh, infested spots. Thank you very much. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you.